here we are at the integration, that point where we've gone through the whole journey and now we're turning to walk back out and to take all that we've gained and all that we've absorbed and really work on applying it in our lives. You've come a long ways. This is a lot of deep material and a lot of content that you've explored. And I'm so excited for you about what's going to happen as you experiment even more and more with applying it in your life. There's a couple kind of um, warnings I want to give you, I guess would be the word, or pitfalls or explanations, so that you achieve the maximum success with this material. Um, what I like to share with people is that change does not happen instantaneously. And one of the things that I've watched that trips people up along the way in this process is this mindset that, okay, I'm going to apply all of this from evermore, from now on, and my relationship's going to be better forever, or my life is going to be better forever. And I want you to understand that the ego gets tripped up on concepts like forever, or always, or have to, and gets tripped, and it gets triggered. So I want you to just take away that pressure. You don't have to do this forever. You just need to do it right now. Take a drop in and take a deep look. What are you doing right now? Align with who you really are right now, and right now, and right now, and right now. If you just manage and master the moment, every moment will string together and guide you toward what you want to create. If you try to manage the future, you're going to get tripped up and the ego's going to get triggered. In fact, I've seen this with couples when I've worked with couples and they've been through strife and difficulty and they've been trying to work it out and then they come and they get some hope and they get enthusiastic because they start to see that they've been doing this all wrong. They've been focusing on the other person instead of dropping in and reconnecting with who they are and what their power is. They've been looking to the other person to fix it or change it or do something different. And that gives them a little bit of hope. But the ego often starts to say, oh my gosh, I don't know if I can try this again. I've been trying so hard and it starts to get panicked. And I just want to tell the ego, relax. You don't have to do it for 10 years. You don't have to do it forever. Just see what you want to do right now. Right now. See if you can do it right now. And just keep doing that and all of that will work itself out. In fact, I often ask couples, if you could be divorced right now, if I can wave a magic wand and have you divorced right this second, would you want to be? And even though they're in a coaching session, usually full of turmoil that they brought to it, they look and they go, right now? Like, right this second? And I go, yeah, right now. Would you like to be divorced right now? Oh, no, not, not right now. Not right this minute. And then I encourage them, if being divorced right now or being broken up right now is not what you desire then see what happens if you align with being in a harmonious, loving relationship. Just see what happens when you align with that. Because if you don't want out, I'm certain you don't want strife. So choose instead to align with creating a harmonious, loving relationship and see what happens as you do that. Right now. Right now. Right now. And see what happens when moment by moment it strings together. Now, one of the things I love to share in the integration session that I think is so important is an explanation of how the process of change happens. And I want you to imagine that it's as if, uh, there's a story about this, I'm going to kind of paraphrase it, but it's as if a woman is walking down the street, not paying much attention, and all of a sudden falls into a deep, dark hole. And it's like a well, it's so dark and so deep. And she's like, oh my gosh, I can't find my way out, I can't see, and, oh, and she's feeling her way around, and she can't find her way out. And just at the moment where she's about to give up in total despair, she finds the spot where she can pull herself out. And she brushes herself off at the top and says, Wow, I am never going back into that hole again. I am going to be so careful and so mindful to never create that reality again. Never fall into that hole again. And then the next day or the next week, month, year, she's walking down that same street and she's being more mindful, but all of a sudden something distracts her just for a split second and she falls in the hole again. And she absolutely can't believe she's back in this mess again. But theory would have it that she could just get right back to where she already knows her way out and she knows it's possible to get out. Theory would have it that she'd just scamper on over to the same place she got out before. 
But in reality, what often happens, and I'm going to use this metaphorically, is that you people come to retreat or they come to this material because they're in a deep, dark hole of depression, anxiety, difficulty, disharmony, something's going astray. And when they come on the retreat or they listen to these tapes and they learn this new material, they climb out and they get to the top and they suddenly see the world differently. Wow, there's possibilities here. This is exciting and they're authentically joyful to do it differently. And then they go out about their business and it could be one minute after you've watched this series, or it could be oh, two weeks from now, they often find themselves where something, they just lost their mindfulness for a minute, and one minute of a loss of mindfulness, the ego goes, there's my chance, and it grabs the wheel, and boom, right into the icebergs. You fall back into the hole. Now, theory would have it that you just pull out all this material, maybe watch it again, maybe think about it again, practice it again, use the six essential life skills, and, and scamper right back out of that hole. But unfortunately, what happens when we find ourselves back in the hole again is that the ego mind takes advantage of that and says, See, I told you, that was a bunch of BS. That wasn't real. That wasn't true. That was a bunch of airy-fairy mumbo-jumbo. And it starts giving you all of this hoopla about why this wasn't real and how it knew that you couldn't really do it. And it's doing that to maintain and restore the status quo. But remember, your ego is not in charge. So when that starts to happen and you're tempted to just take up real estate in that hole and stay there, I really want to invite you to take a deep breath. <sighs> remember who you really are and what you're trying to create. And know that falling in the hole is part of the process. Self-observe, notice what got you in here, notice how it happened, and then take a deep breath, recalibrate with who you really are, and climb back out of the hole. Call for help if you need to. Rewatch these tapes if you need to. Do what you need to do to get out of the hole. Now, the next day, the next month, next week, that same woman's walking down the street and she's being mindful this time. She's practicing being aware and self-observing and noticing what's happening and noticing the results of her words, her thoughts, and her actions. But again, right at that moment, she gets distracted and starts to lose her balance and almost falls in the hole. And it, whether momentum takes her in and she falls again, or whether she's able to pull herself back out is irrelevant. What's relevant is that she saw what happened. Self-observation happened sooner. She noticed what the, the thinking was that was causing her to fall into this hole of depression or anxiety or strife or disharmony and was able to recognize that. Once we become self-observant, we become powerful because we realize we had choices that led to the hole, or the iceberg, if you will. We have choices that lead out as well. So then she climbs out, she brushes herself off, says, never again, I'm never falling in that hole again. The next day she's walking down that same street, and this time she sees the hole and walks around it and successfully navigates through these waters to avoid the difficulties and manages to hit her target. And the next time, she goes, wow, there's a hole on that street. I think I'll just go this way and avoid that street altogether. And metaphorically, I want you to understand that as you go through this process and you gain these skills and tools, you're going to really want to never fall back in that hole again, never go back into depression, never go back into anxiety, never fight with your partner, your spouse, your family, or your coworkers ever again. And that's a lofty and beautiful ambition and good to keep your eye on. And chances are you will still fall in the hole. So that's the bad news, but here's the good news. Every time you fall in the hole and you successfully pull yourself out, Debris falls in from the edges of the hole and makes it shallower and not as, so that you're not as far down. So next time you fall in the hole, it's not as deep, it's not as dark, and it's not as difficult to get out. And the next time you pull yourself out, more debris falls in. So the next time you fall in the hole, and all it requires to fall in the hole is one moment of a lapse of mindfulness. One moment where you're not being self-observant, where you're not paying attention, where you're not minding your own ship. That's all it takes. And all of a sudden you're back in the hole doing the ego dance with someone. Simply notice, <sighs> climb back out, bring yourself back into balance, use those essential life skills, and as you do so, the hole will get shallower. 
I have fallen in the hole so many times, and I continue to do so on a daily basis. The thing is, though, the more you fall in and the more you climb out, the fuller it gets. For me, now, it's a speed bump, and I just kind of trip over it and pull myself back up really quick. And just as I was sharing earlier in one of the sessions, it's like that clown with the weighted bottom. I may go down, but you don't want to stay down. You want to pop back up. You may fall in the hole, but pop back up. What I've found is that when before I knew all this, I would operate from the ego mind, and I would fall in the hole, and I might stay in difficulty for days or weeks or months, maybe even years. Once I learned this and realized that I had the capacity to pull myself out of the hole and regroup, now when I fall, it might be a minute, five minutes on an extremely bad day, might be 30 minutes. That I don't even think has happened for a long time. You just fall, you realize what's going on, and then you take responsibility. That's the secret ingredient for pulling yourself out of the hole and back into alignment so that you can move in the direction you want to go. Sometimes as people journey forth from here, fear starts to take hold. What if I can't do it? What if I'm not good enough? What if somebody else does this or something else happens? And I'd like to take just a moment and talk about the beauty of fear because most of us don't think of it that way. They think we think of it as a bad thing. And my experience and the way I like to define fear is it's like a boulder on our pathway. And as we're walking down this path, we encounter this fear boulder. We want to back away and go, ooh, fear, I don't want to go this way. And your ego may tell you that, oh, wow, this is going to be too much work. This is going to be too hard. You're not going to really be able to do this. What if it doesn't work and it, fear starts merging in your mind and causing you distress? So I want you to notice that and then simply lift that fear boulder up and look for the treasure underneath it because the boulder of fear is marking the spot with, of what you're most passionate about, what matters the most to you. And if you align your behavior with the treasure instead of the fear boulder, you're going to be able to totally transition through that fear toward the target of what you want. Let me give you a practical example of that so that you understand what I mean. If my fear boulder is that my husband's going to cheat on me, and that's the fear that I hold, if I choose to honor that fear boulder with my behavior, then I'm going to be snoopy, distrusting, um, less intimate, less kind. Um, everything is going to be a little edgy because I'm not trusting him and I'm honoring my fear of what he might do. If I look underneath that fear boulder, then what I realize is right underneath that is the treasure of what I really value and want what I really, what my target is, and that's that I have a loving, harmonious, intimate, monogamous relationship with my partner. And when I realize that that's my true objective, then I'm able to whew, reconnect with who I really am and align my behavior with what I want. And when I honor the treasure instead of the fear, then I'm likely to be more loving, more trusting, more open, more intimate, more kind, more caring, and all of the behaviors that are likely to bring my husband into alignment with me in creating that same desired outcome. So I invite you to just notice as your fear starts to materialize that this too is in your control. Just notice what you're worrying about and then take a deeper look underneath that to the treasure and align with that instead. I'm really excited that you've come this far on the journey with us, and I'm hopeful for you that you are able to practice this and apply it in every different way of your life. I'm absolutely certain that as you do, you're going to see amazing results as you go forth. I really encourage you and invite you to practice these different school skills and realize that it is a practice. One of the reasons that I created the Essential Life Skills is that I really needed something to overarch every moment of every day to bring about a difference. And I've found that it truly does. And I'm certain that if you practice this, you'll find that it truly does too. And I'd like to bring you back to the labyrinth as a place where you can practice the essential life skills and really achieve a high level of mastery with them so that when you're on the labyrinth of your life, you have immediate access and can apply them there. If you go to the internet and search on Labyrinth Locator, you'll find labyrinths all over the place. So you won't have to search very far. There are thousands of them on the planet. But one of the things I want to remind you is how beautifully this reflects the six essential life skills. The first one of remembering who you really are is represented by the sacred center. 
And the second one of identifying your target is, rep is represented by the whole thing looking like a bullseye. So what is it that your intentions are? What are you here for? And the third one of self-observation, this is what you do as you walk the labyrinth, as you journey into it. Notice what are you doing? What are you saying? What are you thinking? What are you feeling? Notice what you notice because the labyrinth will mirror to you metaphorically what it is you need to see in yourself. So you can practice being self-observant. If you're being impatient, you'll notice that. If you're being judgmental, you'll notice that. If you're wondering if you're doing it right, you'll notice that. Your need for approval and your need for control will show up in such a way where you get to say, hmm, that's not really serving me, so let me make a new choice and move into the fourth essential life skill of choosing the supportive behaviors, actions, thoughts, and words that do serve you. Take that deep breath. Bring yourself back into the present moment and recalibrate with where you want to go. Recalibrate with your intentions and your target and move in that direction. The language of the labyrinth is metaphor, but you don't need a labyrinth to experience metaphoric wisdom. Everywhere you journey, everywhere you go, imagine that you're on that labyrinth journey and allow everything to mirror back to you what you need to see in yourself. When you're self-observant, it will reveal to you everything you need to see so that you can make choices. And those choices that lead in the direction you want to go are the ones that you want to choose. Now this concept of metaphor is kind of a fun one. So one morning I was reading spiritual scriptures and material and I was I came across this passage that said, hold fast on to the pillar of God. And I went, oh, I love that concept, hold fast on to the pillar of God. And I imagined when I was reading that, that it was like this divine anchor, that this strength, that if we just imagined that we were holding on to this divine anchor all the time, this pillar of God, that we would have that strength that capacity, that wisdom to guide us through the day. And I liken that to this a aspect of ourselves, this core essence, this spirit self, that when we know that that's who we really are, that's the pillar of God to hold on to, that, p that pillar of our own spirit that's made in the image and likeness. So one day I was reading that and my husband, who is a boat captain, called me and asked me if I could come down to the harbor and bring him something. And so I was standing down at the boat harbor waiting for the boat to come in and I'm leaning up against this pillar or this post or pole, if you will. I'm leaning up against it when all of a sudden I reached out and grabbed it and I had that memory of that material that I'd read in the morning, hold fast onto the pillar of God. So I was holding this pole, thinking about this concept, when it occurred to me, if everything is metaphor, perhaps what this sign says is a powerful message for me. And so I looked up to read what the sign said, and it said, never leave your vessel unattended. And I'm, I've used a lot of boat metaphors with you here today, that you're on a relationship, that your spirit is the captain of that ship. And if you truly never leave your vessel unattended, if you are mindful all the time of what you're doing, what you're saying, and what you're thinking, and that what you do, say, and think will lead toward how you feel, and you take responsibility for being the one in charge of that, Thankfully, thanking your spirit, thanking your ego, I mean, for sharing with you that there is an iceberg or something to be concerned about, but then showing it that you're the one in charge. You will be able to navigate these waters safely because you will be the one minding your vessel, your spirit self, your most authentic self. So as you go forth, remember that this heart path journey is an all-the-time process, not a one-time process. Every moment of every day, take that deep breath, journey into your own heart and then continue on your path from there. I invite you just as a way of a final exercise to imagine if you knew that your spirit or your soul held a certain shape, what would that shape be? I don't know if you saw uh, Harry Potter but they have a, a a magical charm called the Patronus, which is their protecting charm. So I want to invite you to consider if your soul were to take on a certain shape like a Patronus or a, a special true protector, not the ego protector, but your true protector, the one that's all capable, all powerful, and able to guide you, what shape would your soul take on? When I think about this, when I take a deep breath and drop into my spirit, I imagine that my soul takes on the shape of a heart. It's balanced, it's peaceful, and it's ever-present. 
And when I get skewed by my need for approval, it gets tweaked out of shape and it becomes uncomfortable. And when I get tweaked by my need for control, it also becomes uncomfortable. And when I am observant and notice that my soul has been tweaked out of shape, if you will, and just take that deep breath and bring myself back into balance, bring myself back into authentic alignment with my soul's true intentions, my soul's true mission, then I'm able to bring that, all of the qualities of that part of my being back into alignment with what I'm here for and what I'm here to create. And whether yours is the shape of a cross or a star or a feather or a heart or a spiral or what have you, if you imagine that same kind of thing and know what your heart's journey will bring you to, and bring yourself back into balance, I'm absolutely positive that you can bring about lasting, powerful, magnificent change in your life. And it will not only heal your own soul, your own family, but the energy of you taking the time to journey into your own heart and bring it back out into the world will have a ripple effect that the whole planet will benefit from. So bless you on your journey. Thank you so much for joining us. And with my deepest aloha, namaste.